Child murder is one of the very worst types of crime. Depriving an innocent youngster any chance of living a full life has often been the reason that whenever the restoration of the death penalty is debated, child murder is usually at the top of the list. The 1950s was to see some horrific child murders and the year 1954 was to feature some of the very worst. We allude to the dreadful case of William Hepper in episode 14 of Tales from the Hangman's Record, who went to the gallows in August of that year. Four months earlier, another child killer was hanged for an inexplicable and brutal crime and despite police building up a strong case to suggest he was the guilty man, he pleaded his innocence to the end. The investigation had slowly grown to another dead end. After 16 days of fruitless searching, during which time police officers had dragged reservoirs, lifted tombstones and combed derelict buildings, the Chief Constable of the Halifax Police Force, West Yorkshire, in the north of England, decided it was time to call for assistance. What had started as a missing person inquiry was now getting more ominous every day, that this might be something far more serious. They were investigating the disappearance of six-year-old Mary Hackett, who had vanished while playing outside her home in Halifax. Mary's father had followed his sister, Surrey Buskin, across the water from their native Limerick Island in the previous year in the search of work. Initially moving on his own, Martin Hackett soon found work with the Halifax Parks Department, which came with its own accommodation at 6 Cemetery Lodge, Lister Lane, and so, at Christmas 1952, he was able to bring his wife Anastasia, son Patrick, and three daughters, Mary, Geraldine and Teresa, over to join him. On Wednesday morning, the 12th of August 1953, the children were off school for the long summer holiday, and Mrs Hackett had an appointment at the hairdressers. With her husband working, Anastasia arranged for her sister-in-law, Sarah, to sit with the children until lunchtime, when she should be home. She gave Mary some money to fetch a loaf of bread, some currant buns and some oranges and along with her two younger sisters, Mary skipped along to the local co-op store. They returned a short time later, consumed an orange and a bun each and after mooching around the house for a while, Mary asked her aunt if she could go and play in the sandpit across the road. Her father, who was working in the backyard fixing a lawnmower, said it was okay but not to be long. And, with the reminder that her mother would be home shortly to serve lunch, Murray went out to play. At ten past one, she hurried across Lister Lane and climbed the six-foot-high wire mesh gate at the entrance to the Technical College Annex. Adjacent to the annex was a large mound of sand used by students at the college studying bricklaying and other building skills. The sandpit was a popular play site for the neighbourhood children in the warm summer sun and stood in the grounds and was next door to the Park Congregational Church directly opposite Murray's home. Fifteen minutes later, after her mother had returned to Cemetery Lodge, she called out to Mary that lunch was ready. When they failed to get the acknowledgement they expected to hear, mother, father and auntie began to search for her. Speaking to neighbours, the only confirmed sighting of Mary Hackett was from a neighbour who had watched her as she scaled the wire gate just after one o'clock. After searching for over an hour, their concerns grew and the police were informed. Officers made door-to-door -door inquiries in the surrounding streets and tracker dogs were brought in, but the trail ended at the gates to the church grounds. They searched the area for the rest of the day, and it was at 8 o'clock on the following morning that Inspector Alexander Dawn and a colleague from the Halifax Borough Police first spoke to Albert George Hall. 47-year-old Hall had been the caretaker and handyman at a children's nursery in nearby Ebden Bridge until obtaining his current job at the Park Church. Hall had only started work on the Monday, and when the officers went to speak to him, they found his living quarters were still full of boxes waiting to be unpacked. Hall was asked if he had seen a young girl in a green coat and hat, and he said he had not. The caretaker was unable to offer any further help, but he did invite the officers to look around the grounds. Satisfied with his statement, the two men left. Initially, there were concerns that Murray's disappearance may be connected to another mystery in Halifax when two boys had vanished on that same Wednesday afternoon from a care home. That search ended on the Friday 
where the two teenage boys were tracked down, having absconded and gone to stay with friends. On Saturday, as local scouts and a mountain rescue party were searching the moors around Halifax, the focus suddenly shifted to Morecambe, across the Pennines in Lancashire, when reports came through of several sightings of a man seen with a young child in a green coat. Heesham Ferryport was a popular departure point for crossings to Ireland, and it was thought that maybe someone had snatched Mary and was taking her back to her native country. Her parents could think of nobody who may wish to do this, nor would have any reason to do so. A watch at all crossings that weekend and checks on passenger lists soon discounted this theory and the search returned to West Yorkshire. On Sunday morning, the usual service took place at the Park Congregational Church with prayers being offered to Mary's family and the hope of their daughter's safe return. Handing out the hymn books to the congregation that included Mary's parents was caretaker Albert Hall. There were several more visits to the grounds of the Park Church over the summer, hampered by the sheer size of the building, the numerous cellars and voids, and the fact all searches in the cavernous basement had to be done by torchlight, as there was no electricity in that part of the church. The crypt was enormous, and during the last war, over 900 residents had sheltered there when the air raid siren had sounded. As each search proved as futile as the last, the Chief Constable of Halifax, Gerald Goodman, decided it was time to seek help. On the following day, Saturday 29th of August 1953, Detective Superintendent John Ball and his assistant, Detective Sergeant Dennis Hawkins, travelled north from London to take over the investigation. As the two Scotland Yard men sifted through the evidence already on file, they decided to speak to the caretaker. According to the incident log, it had already been searched twice by the local officers, but so far there was nothing to suggest anything was amiss. Caretaker Hall greeted their visit with a smile, as he had done on the previous searches, and had been most cooperative to the investigators, even providing tea and biscuits, as they searched the dark and dusty vaults. As the church was directly opposite Mary's home, and she had not been seen since going out to play, the Scotland Yard detectives reasoned she had most likely been killed a short time after, and that made the church and its grounds possible location. They reasoned that a killer who was a stranger to the area would not have bothered to conceal the victim before fleeing, so this made it look like they were looking for a local man. Previous searches had noted that in the crypt was an assortment of old pews and chairs scattered about the floor. On Superintendent Ball's first visit, a number of the chairs had been stacked up neatly in one corner. As the search was taking place, Ball noticed that in one corner of the crypt stood two new tins of paint opened. He asked the caretaker about them, and Hall said they had been bought to repaint the vestry. Hall was advised to replace the lids before the paint dried up. With his ever-present smile, he told the detectives he must have misplaced the lids and they had probably been thrown away with the rubbish. During the conversation, Hall was asked to think back about the day Murray had disappeared, and casually mentioned that he seemed to recall hearing voices in the church that morning where he and his wife had gone to pray. The two detectives exchanged glances. This immediately rang alarm bells with the experienced Scotland Yard men. Why had it taken over a month to recollect something he could have told officers at the start of the investigation? From that moment, Hall became suspect number one. As they returned to their headquarters, Ball and Hawkins discussed why Hall had not mentioned the voices earlier. Also, as a caretaker, Hall would be expected to help with the general upkeep of the church and its outbuildings, it seemed highly unlikely any experienced handyman would lose one lid from a new tin, let alone two. Superintendent Ball and his sergeants pondered this and they concluded that the paint must have been placed to mask some other, perhaps more sinister smell. There were several more visits to the caretaker and each time he addressed the detectives as my friends, offering them tea and biscuits as they looked around the site. On one of these visits, when asked again if he could remember anything from the day Murray disappeared that he hadn't told the other officers, Hall said he seemed to recall a man loitering in the grounds of the church and wearing an overcoat with a blue tie. Later, when asked again about this man, he said it was a blue scarf. The Scotland Yard men conferred with their Yorkshire counterparts 
and all agreed that they felt Hall was their man. And such was his confidence each time they interviewed him, they felt he thought they would not find the body. Therefore, one last search would be made, but this time it would be a massive operation, with art lights, diggers, with staff seconded from other areas to help in the search. On Tuesday, the 21st of September, Ball and Hawkins entered the church and spoke to Albert Hall. The caretaker seemed pleased to see them until he noticed the size of the search party, which included police officers and firemen with all the heavy art lighting and digging tools. The smile now vanished from Hall's face. You have no right to come in here digging, I'm not going to let you in, he protested. Hall made a futile attempt to bear their way and stop them gaining access. Ignoring the caretaker's plea, the search party strolled into the crypt, with Hall standing by helplessly as the new search began. Soon, the mystery of the disappearance of Murray Hackett was solved. In the corner where the chairs had been stacked and paint pots left without lids, officers began digging away at the top layer of earth. After removing three or four inches, they suddenly unearthed what appeared to be a child's court. Further digging soon exposed the body of Murray Hackett. Pathologist Dr David Price was summoned and able to confirm that Murray had sustained extensive head injuries. The back of her skull had been smashed with a very large hole clearly present. Detectives surmised she had been battered about the head with some heavy blunt instrument or her head had been repeatedly banged against a wall or a stone pillar in the crypt. Traces of blood were located on one of the adjacent pillars. Her underclothing was all in place and there was no sign of any sexual assault. A piece of her clothing at one of her shoes was taken to her parents' house and her mother began shrieking and crying as she identified a repair her husband had made on the sole of the shoe. At the inquest, Dr Price was able to give the time of death as around 1.20 on the day Murray vanished. Basing his calculations from the currents from the bun and the orange pith she had eaten that morning and had not been properly digested. Murray's funeral took place a few days later, and large crowds watched the possession as it led to her resting place at Stony Road Cemetery, a few miles from her home. Although he had remained the prime suspect, and this had only strengthened the case against him, finding Murray's body at the crypt, there was, as yet, no hard evidence against Hall. Superintendent Ball had a round-the-clock surveillance put on the caretaker, and on Wednesday the 22nd of September, he was trailed to Scaleborough Park Hospital, a mental asylum in nearby Burley in Wharfdale. All was inside the hospital for over an hour before exiting and catching a bus back to Halifax. As he left, detectives went inside to speak to Dr James Valentine. It was 4.30, just 24 hours after the body had been discovered. The doctor was initially reluctant to break patient confidentiality until told they were investigating a child murder. Valentine then revealed that Hall was a former patient having only been released from his charge in March 1953. Hall told the doctor that the child's body had been found in the church where he worked. The doctor asked if he was involved. Hall said he had come to see him to ask his advice as he was suspected of being involved in the young girl's death. Hall had told the doctor details of Mary's death including head injuries that were only known to the killer and a number of high-ranking officers. Asked if he had seemed disturbed, the doctor said that Hall seemed to possess a clear memory and was highly excited to be caught up in the investigation. Satisfied he was their man, Hall was arrested and charged with murder. Very well I'd be expecting it, he said, as he was handcuffed and taken into custody. There was to be a series of remands at autumn, and Hall was held in the hospital ward at Leeds Armley Jail. It was a busy time at the prison. Already awaiting execution were four men sentenced at the recent assizes, including Polish mill worker, Stanislaw Duras, who had strangled a woman in Halifax a week before the body of Mary Hackett was found. As it turned out, two were sent to Manchester for execution, with Duras hanged in December and another Pole, minor William Labina, who had stabbed his landlady in Barnsley, hanged at Leeds a month later. His four-day trial before Mr Justice Pearson at Leeds Assizes began on Tuesday the 9th of March 1954. Hall was represented by Rudolf Lyons, with Harry Hilton Foster leading for the Crown. The prosecution's case was that 
Hall must have seen Murray from the kitchen of his church hall and was overtaken by some sort of fury. Described as a glib liar who had attempted to befriend the detectives involved in the case, the prosecution alleged that Hall had been the main suspect from the very start of the investigation and the detectives had waited patiently for the evidence to connect him with the murder. This had come when he had spoken to Dr Valentine shortly after the body was discovered, revealing information only the killer could have known. That little girl was murdered by savage blows to the head, either by the murderer raining blow after blow with a bunch instrument, or by the murderer holding the child and hammering her head onto a wall, or stone floor, or some rough surface, the jury was told. Hilton Foster said he supposed there were men who, for purposes of their own, liked to get near little girls in private circumstances. What happened to Murray had obviously happened very quickly. There was an attempt by the defence to suggest the killer was a stranger who had been seen lurking around the grounds in the days before Murray disappeared. One of Murray's classmates from school said, on the day before her friend vanished, she had been playing on the sand when a man had shouted at her. She said he was roughly the same size as her mother. Her mother stood five foot two inches tall. Albert George Hall was just an inch taller. The defence claimed there was no forensic evidence there was no blood found on Hall's two boiler suits, nor on his shoes, although, given the extent of the injuries, Murray's killer would have been splattered with her blood. Although Hall had only been released from the mental hospital in the previous spring, the defence didn't offer insanity or his mental state as part of the defence. The court heard that five years earlier, Hall was stationed at the RAF in North Shields, and he was reported to have masturbated in front of young girls and had tried to entice them to go off with him. He was later discharged from the RAF in 1949 on medical grounds. Hall and his wife Emily had then settled in her native West Riding of Yorkshire. Two years later, he was reported to the police for passing an obscene letter to an eight-year-old girl. Following his arrest, he agreed to be treated at a mental hospital in Huddersfield. In his summing up to the jury, Hilton Foster said, There was no suggestion there was anyone who wanted to exterminate Mary Hackett, but perhaps they might think that in killing of a little girl of six, they did not have to look for a motive. When a child in those circumstances began to realise what had happened and did not like something that was said to her or something that she saw and began to make a noise, to silence her in a moment of fright might just be a second's work. The trial concluded on the Saturday, fourth day of proceedings, and after hearing all the evidence, the jury retired to consider their verdict. The jury were housed in a room below the stage in the town hall, and as their deliberation continued, they were drowned out by a band booked for the concert in the hall that night. They were moved to a different part of the building, and finally, just after 10.30 that evening, they reached their verdict. It took them over six and a half hours, one of the longest deliberations of the time, to find Hall guilty as charged. Hall swayed into the arms of a warder as the guilty verdict was given. Asked if anything to say before sentence of death was passed, Hall said, I am not guilty of this terrible crime. It is a terrible crime, I admit, but I am not guilty of it. I just thank you, my lord, for judging the trial in the best of. Then, the man who could not stop talking to the police finally ran out of words. Hall launched an appeal that was quickly dismissed with the Lord Chief Justice Goddard making reference to the question of Hall's mental health and his incarceration in the asylum and the issues of insanity that weren't really fully explored at the trial. A reprieve was refused, as was a petition to the Queen for mercy. Hall's wife believed his innocence and remained a regular visitor until the end, even writing a personal letter to Murray's parents claiming her husband was innocent. At nine o'clock on Thursday the 22nd of April 1954, Albert George Hall was hanged at Armley Jail Leeds by Steve Wade and Harry Smith, who both travelled together from Doncaster to carry out the execution. It was the first of five occasions the two men, who at one point had lived on the same Doncaster street, had worked together. Eighteen years later, in the spring of 1972, with Hall lying in a felon's grave inside the grim Victorian jail and the case long forgotten to all but those involved, a man walked into a police station at Hull and claimed he was responsible for the murder of Mary Hackett. Detectives still serving who had worked on the original investigation felt the confession was false, but the case was reopened 
and new detectives based in Scotland Yard ran an investigation. The confession was soon discarded and the investigation closed, case papers returned to the file, marked, solved. As the Congregational Church changed nationally through the latter part of the 20th century, the church where Mary Hackett was murdered was renamed Park United Reformed Church and worship there continued until 1980. By this time, church attendance had shrunk and so services were held in the building that had been the Sunday school before complete closure in the 1990s. It then became the Benbridge Park Centre, a centre for local businesses and charities. The building is still standing and is currently a Muslim education and culture centre. Albert George Hall always maintained his innocence, although he had pretty much condemned himself by telling the doctor at the hospital the cause of the child's death, something only senior detectives, the pathologist and the killer knew. That, on top of other evidence they had amassed, was enough for the police to be certain he was their man. The body was found in the crypt of the church where Hall worked, and although he was happy for detectives to make a search of the grounds and cellars by torchlight, he became enraged when the Scotland Yard detectives turned up with arc lights and shovel, shouting at them that they couldn't come in. Was that proof he knew what they would find? As we saw in 1972, police received a confession from another man that was checked out by Scotland Yard and quickly rejected. Despite some feeling that a miscarriage of justice may have taken place, Superintendent Ball had no doubt he had arrested the right man, and although he could find no real motive, he later recalled he believed Hall may have done something to sufficiently frighten the young girl, enough for her to tell her parents, which could have led to him getting in trouble. And it's always been a good motive to silence your only witness. Thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Your support really is important to help keep the channel growing. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, for information on my books and for links to other videos in the series. The website shop also sells copies of the Hangman's Record 3 volume series, plus assorted older titles and copies of volumes 1 and 2 of Tales from the Hangman's Record paperback. These are also available as a Kindle download through the Amazon site. Volume 3 is due very soon. Please take a look at my new podcast channel, Mostly Murder, which features a variety of true crime cases and is available on Spotify and all the usual platforms. Do you agree the verdict was correct? Was Hall guilty or an innocent man as he maintained? Use the comments below for your thoughts on this case and for suggestions for further episodes. So, until the next time, thank you and goodbye.